Well, it's good to be with you all and back again. And uh, we do have a lot back there on the table, and that's just for you all. It's whatever looks like you could use it, please do. And the Alaskan DVD, we finally finished after three years of hard work. And uh, we couldn't get all the animals on one DVD, so we have, we're going to have to have a volume two. And then the uh, people doing it said, but you're, why don't you talk about some of the amazing vegetation of Alaska? These plants that survive those harsh climates and things. So we're probably going to have a third one that we get into some of the, uh, the vegetation of Canada, I mean of Alaska. And um, so anyway, so just pick up whatever you think uh, you, you could use back there. We have, do we have the Alaska cards? And the girls uh, designed some Alaska animal card tracks. And all the animals, I think, that will be on volume two uh, are in the cards. So I think there's like four cards of each kind of animal. And they're, they're not like playing cards, they're tracks. They're little card tracks that you can give to people. And even toll booth operators take them. So that's amazing. Uh, when we were just used to use just regular tracks, and, and we, we try to keep some of those handy, uh, you, you hand a regular track to a lot of toll booth operators. Oh, I've seen all those. I, I don't, no, thank you. So now we, hey, have you ever heard of an I I? An I I? What's an I I? Well, here, would you like to read about it? Well, yeah, thank you. And uh, so they, now they thank us for giving them tracks. But anyway, uh, we got the polar bear back there and, and some other ones. And you'll notice on the DVD of Alaska, I'm a little stiff with the polar bear about six feet behind me. And uh, my instructions were, don't look at the polar bear, don't say its name. Its name is Aggie, A-G-E-E. -E. And you can Google Aggie the polar bear, all kinds of stuff on YouTube about Aggie. If, if, the, if you see a polar bear like on a commercial or something, that's Aggie. She's the only, as far as we know, she's the only polar bear in the world that will actually do things for a man and not eat the man. And, uh, and so, by God's grace, we got to film her. Actually, it was two little boys up in Kansas prayed for a year that we would get to film Aggie the polar bear. And, uh, and, and by God's grace, we did. So those two little boys were really excited when we told her, yeah, yeah, we, by God's grace, we did it. And they were really excited. And, uh, but anyway, I look pretty stiff when, when I'm talking with the polar bear right behind me. So forgive me for that. <laughs> He's, don't bend over. Don't look at the bear. Don't say its name. Don't say my name, Mark Dumas. Just say what you want to say. So the polar bear's behind me, and I'm just saying what I want to say. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so we're going to talk. I was asked, really, Mr. Rice asked me to talk about um, mutualism and symbiosis, and then um, why is creation uh, foundational to Christ biblical, the biblical Christian worldview? So that'll be in the second service. And so, a little bit here on mutualism and symbiosis. Um, and I, I put this, this is very simplistic because uh, we, we put this together so we could do it at schools, and, and which we have done, and things like that. So, some of you that are highly technical, uh, you might say, well, that's a little too simplistic, but it's so little minds can get it too. And I'm not saying you all have little minds. I mean, little people with little minds. Maybe their minds are big. But anyway, we're going to be looking at some phenomenal mutualistic relationships, symbiotic relationships. And I think it's a good defense for biblical creation. Now, how could these things evolve that are mutually dependent upon each other? They have to be there at the same time, or both of them are dead, or at least one of them is. And so, uh, symbiosis, that's a close uh, relationship between individuals, two or could be more than two. There's one parasite has seven different hosts to survive. Fascinating. So, it has to live in seven different hosts in order to get the final product out here. Now, how would that evolve? How can you have all seven hosts right where they need to be in all this? Anyway. Uh, sometimes a symbiotic relationship benefits both species, like we have certain types of uh, 
bacteria in our intestinal tract. And we keep them alive, and they help keep us alive as long as they don't get out of control. So it's, it's a mutual benefit to both of us that certain types of E. coli actually are good for us. There's some that aren't. Uh, anyway, uh, then sometimes one species benefits, but the other doesn't. And uh, that would be maybe like a tapeworm. You know, you get a tapeworm, that's, that's not going to benefit you at all, but it definitely benefits the tapeworm. <laughs> so anyway, those are the different things, and there's different ones here. There's mutualism, commensalism, parasitism. Mostly we hear about the mutual things and the parasite things. And then there's, there's others, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, definition here um, in biology. Living together of two dissimilar organisms, as in mutualism, commensalism, amensalism, parasitism, also any interdependent or mutually beneficial relationship between two persons or groups. Mutualism, a relationship between two or more species of organisms, both or all of them benefit from the association. And so, a thought provoker here. How do symbiotic or mutualistic relationships provide evidence against evolution and for special creation? Symbiotic mutualistic relationships between living organisms show at least two and sometimes several organisms, they have to exist at the same time and in the same place with exactly the right characteristics for each of them um, so that they can survive. And many of them can't survive without each other. So how, how, does, how does evolution explain it? Oh, just give us enough time, it'll happen. They don't have time. They need to be there from the very first time that particular organism pops up, which is when God created it. Only God could have set this in place. For example, evolutionists teach life came from a single-celled organism that gradually, over millions of years, evolved into multiple-celled forms and eventually becoming man. So what do the evolutionists teach? You had your Big Bang, and then somehow uh, stars formed, mostly out of hydrogen, a little helium, and then those first-generation stars blew up, and that formed second-generation stars, and then second-generation stars blew up, and that formed planet Earth and all kinds of things like that. And then here's planet Earth now, and it started molten hot, then cooled down, and then water came here from comets and volcanic activity. And ultimately in the water, somehow um, uh, organic materials popped up coming out of inorganic materials. That's a big step. And then the, inner, the organic material somehow came to life. That's a big step. See, these are all steps of faith that evolution has. And then out of this life, which, by the way, what did the first life eat? What did that first speck of life, what kept it alive? Okay, because it's out of a hostile environment there. But anyway, so here comes this first speck of life. Ultimately, that evolved into something like blue-green algae or some kind of bacteria. And then over hundreds of thousands of years, that evolved into you. Gradually, over millions of years, here you are. So that takes faith at every single step of the way. If that was true, how did the earliest life forms get their food? How did flowers get pollinated if they evolved before the insects or the insects before the flowers? What, what did they eat? Because some insects, that is what they eat, is what nectar and things. How did the right amount of sunlight come? See, we have to have exactly the right amount of sunlight which meant that Earth had to be exactly the right distance from the sun. Well, that meant the moon had to be the right size, to be exactly the right distance from the sun and from the Earth to make the tidal patterns work. See, it's called the anthropic principle. It looks like Earth was created with man in mind, which it was, because it's the center of God's redemptive plan. And uh, so all these things have to work together. Symbiotic relationships within the creation provide dramatic evidence, I believe, against evolution, although I was an evolutionist almost half my life. I'm going to share a little more of my testimony in the second service because I haven't done that in quite a few years. All right, so many creatures and organisms have such highly specified needs outside of themselves, such as the need to be at the right place at the right time 
in order to work with and sustain other individual life forms. Only a Creator God, the Lord Jesus, could coordinate all these options. And there's all kinds of options out there. Would a mindless, random, chance, non-directed, non-purposeful process produce all of this? Well, I used to believe it, but I, I see now it's impossible. It couldn't happen. Isaiah 42 says this in 5 and 8. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it. Did you thank the Lord for your breath this morning? <laughs> well, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have it, right? Let's thank him for all these things he gives us. Um, by the way, he stretched out the heavens. That kind of helps, I think, with the speed of light problem. People say, oh, yeah, but we, it took millions of years to get light from those farthest stars to here. Well, what if God made the stars in closer with the light here and then he moved the stars out? That's the way he describes it. Uh, there's other things there. But anyway, I think it helps. And so what else? He gives us breath and spirit to them that walk there. And then he says this, I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Evolution steals God's glory. It robs him of his praise. What's the purpose of evolution? Get rid of God. We can be here without God. That's the whole purpose. I'll show you a couple quotes in the next, next service about that. Maybe you've seen them before. Anyway, here's some examples. Symbiosis in the coral reef. If single-celled life forms came first, as the evolutionists teach, then the relationship of the parrotfish to both algae and the coral reef is excellent evidence, I believe, against the belief of evolution. Many corals have algae dependent upon them for life. However, if evolution is true, what did the algae live on before the coral evolved? Because they provide each other with food and shelter and different things. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, that creates another problem. Unhindered, the algae will suffocate the coral, or it'll bloom and kill out whole reefs within a three-week period of time. Algae just proliferates, unless there's something there to keep it under control. And there's several mechanisms God has to keep it under control, including the coral itself. If the algae and the coral were not created at the same time, the algae wouldn't have anywhere to live, these particular species. But then would the coral survive without the nutrients that the algae provides? The algae provides the nutrients for the coral. And uh, this is... Uh, Professor David Yellowless, he says this, it's an incredibly intricate relationship in which the corals feed the algae and try to control their diet. So the coral controls the diet of the algae, and there's reasons for that. And the algae in turn use sunlight to produce the junk food, the carbohydrates and the fats that the corals need. There's an amazingly designed relationship here. Random chance, no way I could explain it. Inside each of the coral polyps lives one-celled algae, zooxanthellae, which each of these little organisms gives off the oxygen and the nutrients that the coral needs to survive. So the coral feeds the algae, the algae feeds the coral, and in the return, the coral polyp gives off the carbon dioxide the algae need to allow photosynthesis to take place. So they both need each other to stay alive. So you can't have one without the other of these particular species. The photosynthesis then produces the sugars and the amino acids as nutrients for the coral. If the coral did not live in sun-filled shallow waters, the algae could never survive because there would be no sunshine for the photosynthesis. So the, the coral has to be in the right depth of water for all this to work. If evolution is true, how did all of this just happen at the right time? Dead things don't evolve into more complex life forms. And if it wasn't exactly right, they would be dead. The coral provides the algae with protected environment and the compounds necessary for photosynthesis, which are metabolic waste products of the coral. In return, the algae produce the oxygen, and they help the coral remove waste. And more importantly, they supply the coral with the organic products of photosynthesis, which are predominantly carbohydrates. 
So that's how they do it. The compounds are utilized by the coral as building blocks in the manufacture of fats, as well as the synthesis of their calcium carbonate skeletons. These little algae are critical elements in the continuing health of the reef building coral. As much as 90% of the organic material they manufacture photosynthetically is transferred to the coral. Amazing. Another byproduct of this relationship is color. Coral, as you know, you buy a piece of coral at the coral shop, what color is it? It's white. Now there is one species that does produce a pink color near Bermuda, and then there's another one that does produce a blue color, and that's over near uh, Japan, the Philippines. Uh, but the fact is, the algae provide the color. And so, you have something like that in the coral. It's beautiful, or like that. But the coral is not providing the color. It is the algae that provides the color. And a particular species of algae likes a particular species of coral. They somehow find each other, and then the color and everything becomes characteristic of that coral, but it's really from the algae. How would that evolve? And how, look, beautiful, it's beautiful. And somehow they work together and, uh, and become beautiful. Algae and coral, coral have such close a symbiotic relationship with each other that if the algae start undergoing too much photosynthesis, so now the algae is going to have too much photosynthesis going on, and they don't reduce the amount of chlorophyll in response, it produces high levels of oxygen in the coral's tissue, and that can kill the coral. So to try to control the oxygen level in the coral, and the oxygen is produced by the algae, the coral may expel some of the algae. How do they know to do that? A coral, what is it? And it's there, and oh, I'm getting too much oxygen. Oh, I know, that's the algae. They're produ I better get rid of some of them. And it just throws out some of the algae so that it keeps the right amount of oxygen. There's no way, no way that could evolve. A break in the relationship can cause the coral's death. And you get this bleaching. Too much uh, algae will uh, just kill it, basically. It turns white. That's its color. It dies, and then it, it gets hard. If too much bleaching occurs, the coral dies. If by chance the algae and the coral are able to survive the process of evolution, they found each other before starvation, then another problem is looming. The rapidly multiplying algae will suffocate its host. So in steps the parrotfish. So there's all three of these are necessary on the coral reef. The parrotfish live primarily in the coral reefs where the water's shallow and and it's warm, tropical. Their main diet is the algae. That's what they like to eat, the algae that lives in the coral reef. Now the problem is when the parrotfish eats the algae off the coral, it also many times bites off some of the coral, okay? And uh, so it has a special kind of teeth that most fish don't have. It has some grinding teeth in the back of its mouth. And these grinding teeth will grind up the hard coral that it bites off, and so it doesn't choke to death. So that had to be there. It has special teeth in the front for biting off the algae with some of the coral. And uh, matter of fact, the waste of the parrot fish produces a lot of the sand on the beaches, which is most probably the reason there's that pink beach in Bermuda because the parrotfish eat that pink coral, and then they excrete, well, they grind it all up, and then they excrete pink sand, and there's a whole pink sand beach. Uh, over, has anybody seen that pink, pink sand beach? Yeah, in coral. It's, I haven't seen it. I'd like to sometimes. Uh, the creator equipped these amazing fish with not only teeth in the front of their mouths. I'm a dentist, okay. I'd like to talk about teeth. But also, these flat top grinding teeth way in the back before they swallow. The grinding teeth are crucial for the parrotfish's nutrition. They break apart the walls of the algae, releasing the nutrients for digestion. If evolution is true, how did these fish realize they could eat the hard coral and not die? 
Even the waste of the parrotfish is extremely useful to ocean life. It partially comprises the beaches of many tropical islands, helping to begin the propagation of new plants and other life forms. On the ocean floor, as excreted, also lays a foundation for new coral formation. See, everything God does ha has purpose, and it all is to keep this place a nice place for us to live. Well, I have another talk on uh, Earth's environmental cleanup systems. I don't think we ever talked about that. Have you ever thought about that? Every single thing that dies, there is something else our Lord made to eat it. All the way down, you walk in the woods. How come there aren't 10 miles of leaves? You walk, they come down all these tons and tons of leaves every year. You go out the next year, where are they? Where'd they go? And it doesn't stink like most mulch piles that are out of balance with too much anaerobic bacteria. Our Lord made bacteria, fungus, uh, algae, all kinds of little things that eat. And then he has bigger things like hyenas, you know, eat the bones and they'll clean up the bones. And then they have waste and here comes your dung beetles and they'll take care of that. And then they'll bury some of that. Then here comes your worms, and they'll eat some of that. And it gets all the way down to the basic chemical components, and then the trees pick it up and starts all over again. How would that evolve, you see? If there is no God, I mean, and then so many Christians are what we call theistic evolutionists or progressive creation. They believe God used millions of years to get us here. You can't have millions of years to do these kinds of things. It all had to be done Boom, like that. Or it just doesn't work. All right, so by the way, the parrotfish, uh, they just kind of put their eggs out in the water, and the coral reef, they go into the coral reef, and so the coral reef becomes the nursery for the parrotfish baby fish. So the parrotfish doesn't want to eat too much of the coral reef because that's where its babies are going to grow. So it has to kind of keep in mind, okay, I'm eating a little bit here and here and here. and here. Yep, It all works uh, according to God's plan. So let's look at something else. Psalm 45 says this, I will extol thee, my God, O king, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee. By the way, did we do that today? Have you blessed God today? Did you wake up this morning and think, oh, Lord, what a blessing you are to us I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another. Are we doing that? Praising God's works to the next generation. And shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. Amen. Yes, we will. All right, the anglerfish <clears throat> lives, lives deep down in the ocean, a mile down and more. Um, it has a fishing pole right out of its head. And different species, some of them have shorter ones, longer ones. And the, 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 the fish pole has a lure on the end that lights up because it's down there where it's dark, okay? So how is it going to find its food? Well, it lets its food find it with this light it has up here on the end of the fish pole. So the bacteria has a chemical, Lucifer. There's a bacteria that comes to live in the fish pole, in the lure at the end of the fish pole. And the bacteria has a chemical called luciferin, and that reacts with oxygen to create light, which is heatless light. We would do well to invent something like that, wouldn't we? A uh, second chemical the bacteria has is called luciferase. That is the catalyst that makes it all work. And, of course, evolutionists named all these things, as far as I know. And I don't know why they call it luciferin, but because maybe what's, Lucifer's known as an angel of light. He disguises as an angel of light. Uh, anyway, it's this activity of the bacteria within the organic light bulb that turns it on. So, there's reactions going on in the bacteria that generate the light, but somehow the fish can tell the bacteria, turn on the light, turn off the light. What? 
What is going on? Science still don't know how the fish controls the light. What is going on? You see? It, it, is the fish pole of the fish somehow talking to the bacteria and saying, I need the light right now. No, 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 I don't want the light. No, I got enemies around me right now. I don't, turn off the lights, turn off. See, there's PhDs in marine biology here for young people. What is going on? Uh, the photobacteria enter through pores on the end of the angler's lure. So it's got this thing, and the bacteria come in through little pores. And then once inside, the fish feeds it. Okay, the fish feeds the bacteria. At the same time, the anglerfish benefits from the relationship by gaining the ability to use the bacteria's bioluminescence to attract its prey, possibly even its mates. They don't know for sure. Scientists are still unsure of all the intricacies of this relationship. Yeah, they sure are. Jesus Christ is the creator. Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. I read King James. Colossians 1, talking about Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him, talking about Jesus. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All things hold together. He holds everything together. What holds the atom together? A negatively charged uh, electron, positive nucleus. Why don't they crash into each other? What? 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 God says, I do it. Okay? Uh, you are 100% left-handed amino acids. But yet in nature, if you have left-handed amino acids, they want to break down into right-handed amino acids to get an equal amount of both. But you're 100% left-handed. You throw a right-handed one in and rigor mortis sets in. God says, I hold everything together. I give life. I am, what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. He's the creator. So God the Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, through the agency of Jesus, created everything. So because Jesus is the creator, John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, Ephesians 3, 9, because Jesus is the creator, that gives him the right and the authority to be the Savior. Because only the Creator would have the right to save His particular creature, which is us. Now, here's another one. This is the um, acacia tree. It's called the bullhorn acacia. It, it has these thorns that look like, I'm from Texas, they look like a Texas longhorn cow. And they really do. And uh, it's fascinating. Because the bullhorn acacia uh, is not like other acacia. Other acacia, the leaves have a bitter, they have an alkaloid, it's a bitter taste, even though giraffes like it, okay? But most animals don't want to eat it. But this one, the leaves taste good. So anything that likes to eat leaves could eat it, except for the fact that God made this little ant, the bullhorn acacia ant. And the ant uh, moves into the tree and then moves into the base of the thorns. And then they live in the hollow part inside the thorns. And if anything disturbs the tree, these ants come zooming out. I'm just going to talk about the ants for a minute. Uh, they come zooming out. They have a really painful sting, but they also have a pungent stench. They stinketh, okay? And so, uh, even cattle, if they disturb these ants, and, they, and, and this, this stink comes off the plant, even cattle kind of turn around, and they want to go somewhere else. It's just a pungent odor from this. Now, the tree 
has two little things to feed the ants. Uh, one of them, they're called Belshan bodies. They're at the tips of the newly formed leaves. And they're full of oils and uh, uh, proteins and uh, all kinds of nutrients. And scientists haven't been able to find any purpose whatsoever for those Belshan bodies except to feed the ants. It is exactly what, and there's one more thing. Uh, there are also, they're little, like little uh, volcanic shaped um, pots that are at the base of the horns, and they have in them water, sometimes amino acids, and so they keep the ants hydrated. So here you have this tree that doesn't have a defense against the animals that might want to eat it. So God made a particular species of ant to live in that tree. That means the tree and the ant, they got to be somewhere where they're both there because that's the only ant that does it. And then he made the tree produce exactly what that ant needs for food. So the ant protects the tree in all kinds of ways. They even trim the tree so it'll grow better. And the tree feeds the ant. Now, how, how would evolution, a mindless process, no matter how many millions of years you had, how's that going to produce that? Because they are both, it's called obligatory mutualism. That's the scientific name. And it's, they are obliged mutually to keep each other alive. There's no way, no way. A chance, random, accidental, non-purposeful, non-directed process would do that. Even though I believe those kinds of things half my life. Give it enough time, it'll happen. Nope, not going to happen. So anyway... Scientists done experiments where the ants were not allowed to populate the trees. What happened? The trees suffered from all kinds of predators. They were overgrown. They died. So they, they pulled the ants out. Nope, you're not going to go to that one. Even secular scientists consider the mutualistic relationship between the bullhorn acacia and its specified pseudomyrmex ants one of the most amazing things that has been observed by evolution. <laughs> They go on and say that. And no, it isn't. Isaiah, what's it say there? For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he established it, he created it, not in vain. By the way, I think this is God's commentary on Genesis chapter 1. The same kind of words, tohu, abohu, it started out unformed and unfilled. He said, no, yeah, yeah, I started it unformed and unfilled, then I formed it and filled it. He said, uh, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. That's the only thing God says he ever created to, for, to be inhabited is planet Earth. He created it, planet Earth, to be inhabited. I don't believe there's life anywhere else but here. This is the center of God's redemptive plan. He said, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said, I'm not under the seed of Jacob. Seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Well, that's our Lord. And our time is up. I will say a little prayer. Father, I thank you that we could look at a few of the wonders of your creation uh, this morning together. And I pray we're encouraged. We can trust you. We can trust your word. You've given it to us. You have um, <clears throat> you've provided everything we need. You've preserved your word for us down through the ages. We still have Greek and Hebrew manuscripts that go way, way back there. And uh, we can trust you, and we can trust your word, and we can trust the Lord Jesus for our salvation. I pray if someone is here today, they've never trusted Jesus as their Savior. Today would be their day of salvation. They would receive their creator and savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, as their savior today. And all of us will be in heaven one of these days, I pray in the strong name of our crucified and risen Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.